Okay, I think we can get started. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the future of Apache Storm. Um, so I'm assuming um, everyone here has, has some level of knowledge of Storm. So how many people are using or have good knowledge of Storm? Okay, good. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a member of the technical staff at Hortonworks. Um, I'm the PMC chair of Apache Storm. Um, I'm also an ASF member, and I, um, I'm involved in a number of, of other Apache projects um, and also mentor um, a number of uh, projects that are in the Apache incubator right now. So a little bit of history before we get into the future. Um, the Apache Zero Storm 0.9x um, series of releases was when Storm originally moved to Apache and graduated from the incubator. Um, that was the first official Apache release. Um, for that, when we moved to Apache, we needed to drop 0MQ um, in favor of Netty, uh, largely because 0MQ um, was LGPL um, licensed, which isn't comp compatible with Apache licenses. Um, but also, that was the, the first um, big improvement to Storm um, in terms of performance um, since it, it left Twitter. Um, in that series, we also expanded integration. Uh, so prior to that, we had um, lots of integration components that were just spread out across all sorts of um, different GitHub projects, and it was difficult to keep them in line um, with newer Storm versions. Um, particularly the, the Kafka integration. Um, so we brought those into the um, Apache Storm project so we could keep the versions in line and make sure they were, were consistent with every release. And that's also when we started to address uh, dependency conflicts um, between uh, Storm runtime dependencies and user runtime dependencies. So the next major release of Storm was 0 0.10, and that was largely about enterprise readiness. Um, in 10.x, we introduced security and multi-tenancy, and that's what a lot of um, enterprises really needed um, in order to be able to adopt Apache Storm. Um, prior to that, um, like at, at Twitter, Twitter had no security requirement um, for Storm because they, they pretty much controlled their, their in-house data center and uh, did security through um, IP tables. Uh, 0.10x also enabled rolling upgrades. Um, so in versions after 0.10.0, you can do a rolling upgrade um, from one version to the next without um, having to drop your clusters. Um, we also introduced declarative wiring Declarative topology wiring with Flux. Um, that allows you to build your various spouts and bolts, put them in a jar, and use an external text file to describe the DAG uh, that represents your, your topology. Um, and that made things a lot more flexible. So you could do things like um, add, a, add a remove um, bolts and spouts from a topology. Um, and it also made it easier to externalize the configuration. Um, so you could have a single file that represents your topology for a development environment, um, and then have a separate one for a production deployment, and the actual jar that contains all your components um, does not have to change. Uh, that release also introduced um, a partial key groupings, which um, addressed uh, dealing with data skew um, among uh, fields groupings. We also improved logging. We moved to Log4j2, which is a lot faster and more performant. Um, we added Hive integration, Azure Event Hub integration, Redis integration, and also JDBC integration. Most of those are, um, some are, are bolts, for example, JDBC, but also some of them are, are spouts, for example, Azure Event Hubs. So yesterday we released Apache Storm 1.0. Um, 
And this release is mainly about maturity and performance improvements. So some of the improvements, one of the first one is Pacemaker. Um, Pacemaker is a heartbeat server that replaces Zookeeper for heartbeats. Um, it's essentially an in-memory key value store and heartbeats in Storm are ephemeral, so there's really no reason for them to, to have to hit disk. Um, so we can store those in, um, in memory um, and if we, we lose them, they'll just reappear. And what this allowed is um, it allowed us to scale to uh, massive size clusters where um, we have, you know, two to three thousand uh, supervisor nodes or even higher. Um, this was really, really important for Yahoo because Yahoo has, um, they're one of the biggest storm users um, in the world, um, at least in, in North America. Um, so they needed that in order to be able to scale to that. Um, Pacemaker is also um, secure. Um, so following on the, the security story from the 0 0.10 releases, um, it supports Kerberos and Digest authentication. Um, also, Pacemaker is not required. Um, but out of the box, Pacemaker isn't used. It will just pass through to Zookeeper. Um, but if you do use Pacemaker, um, Heartbeats will go to Pacemaker and then any um, state up to updates that need to be persisted in Zookeeper will pass through. So compared to Zookeeper, Pacemaker uses a whole lot less memory and CPU. Um, it doesn't hit the disk, so you're, you're really spared the, the overhead of maintaining consistency um, among the quorum, which was one of the, um, the performance issues we hit with Zookeeper. Um, Storm 1.0 introduces a distributed cache API. So in the past, a lot of people, what they would do is include resources, um, topology resources like dictionaries, uh, machine learning models, geolocation data, anything that um, was data that supported your topology, these were packaged, a lot of times packaged in the, the storm jar itself, um, which is fine for small files, but when you get into the order of gigabytes, um, large files negatively affect the startup time of topologies. Um, it's also a big pain because any change to those support files requires repackaging and redeployment um, of your topology. So the distributed cache allows sharing of files across um, one or more topologies, and files can be updated from the command line. So rather than package those files in your topology, um, you submit them to the, the distributed cache, and they're made available to um, the cluster. And those files can change over time. So whereas before they were static and part of the topology, um, now they're externalized. It also allows for compression, so you can compress them, and when they get distributed among the, the supervisor nodes in the storm cluster, it will automatically um, unarchive them if necessary. Right now we have two implementations. There's a local file system blob store and an HDFS blob store. Uh, the local implementation supports replication factor. So you can say, okay, I want to, I have seven supervisor nodes in my cluster and I want to make sure this file is available on at least three. You, um, when you upload your, your blob to the distributed cache, you, you tell it how many, you know, what replication you want. And both these implementations support ACLs. So you can, um, if you're, you're in a secure environment where um, storm topologies run as the user that, are, that submits the topology, um, you can say, okay, these users can, only these users can have read access or write access um, to the file in the distributed cache. So this is what it looks like to create a, a blob in the blob store, use the storm blob store command. Um, here we're creating one, and 
it's the local file is dict.txt, so presumably that's like a, a lookup table. And we're giving it um, an ACL with read-write access, and then we're specifying a replication factor, and we're associating a key with it, um, which will be used by the topology. Then to make it available to your topology, um, you use the typical storm jar command to deploy your topology, um, and you tell it that the file is available under key one, and that it's not compressed, and uh, what local name um, to use for that, that file. And what that means is when, um, what, what happens is when that, when a supervisor downloads that file, it will localize it. So it's gonna take it, um, pull it from the distributed cache and localize it to make it av locally available to the topology. And here we're just gonna rename it to essentially the same name that we used to, to upload it. High availability Nimbus is another 1.0 feature. Um, in the past, Nimbus was what I called a uh, soft point of failure. Um, so if you lost Nimbus in a topology, or if you lost Nimbus in your storm cluster, um, your, any existing topologies would continue to run and you wouldn't lose any data. Um, but you wouldn't be able to submit new topologies until that, um, until Nimbus came back up. Another piece is, another responsibility of Nimbus is to reassign work in the event of a supervisor or worker loss. And without Nimbus, you, you lose that capability as well. So what we did in 1.0 is allow you to run multiple Nimbuses. And one of those is, is there's always one leader Nimbus and when you submit topologies, um, it will go to that Nimbus and then distribute the, the uh, topology out to the cluster. So in the event of failure, so let's say your leader, leader Nimbus goes down, um, Storm will perform leader election, and a new leader will be elected, and now you'll be able to continue seamlessly. Does it matter where you submit the topology from? Um, when you submit a topology, you have a, um, in your local configuration, you tell it um, what nimbuses are in your um, cluster. And will it know to identify the leader by itself, or you have to specify it? It'll figure out what the leader is itself. So what HA Nimbus does is increase the overall availability of Nimbus. Um, Nimbus hosts can join and leave the the cluster at any time. It uses the distributed cache API that I uh, talked about earlier um, to distribute all the files that your topology depends, depends upon to the available Nimbuses. So if, if one goes down and it had all your, your files, you're guaranteed that a, another Nimbus will have all your files um, so it can um, guarantee that it can restart workers without losing anything. Um, another great feature in 1.0 is now native streaming Windows. So with Windows before, before 1.0, users, any kind of windowing use case, users were required to um, implement that themselves. Now in 1.0, um, it's native. So you can extend a base class and get windowing in your topology. So basically, you specify a length, either a temporal duration or tuple count, and then a slide interval, which is how often you advance that, that window. So a sliding window, essentially the, the window just slides over time, and windows can overlap. With tumbling windows, they don't overlap. So the window will advance across uh, distinct sections of, of tuples over time or, or count. So windowing and storm supports timestamps, event time, ingestion time, and, and or processing time. Um, it supports out of order, dealing with out of, out of order tuples. Um, watermarks, um, watermarks are a means of dealing with l late data coming in. Um, so essentially if, the, if a, an event coming in is late, it will be above the, the watermark. 
and uh, we support state checkpointing as well, and that's automatic. I'll get into um, how state check checkpointing works in a little bit. So state management, we now support um, stateful bolts with automatic checkpointing. So before, um, if you needed to support any kind of safe state in your bolts, you had to implement that yourself. Um, now we, we support it natively. Um, so what you see when you use stateful bolts in your topology is just a regular old stateful bolt and a regular bolt. And I'll, I'll show you what happens on, underneath the hood in a little bit. Um, this is what it looks like to um, implement a, a stateful bolt. You essentially, the easiest way is to extend base stateful bolt. And in your, there's a method called init state. And what that will do is pass a key value state implementation um, that you can store off and then you can read and update your state. So here, simple word count example, um, we increment a count. Well, we, we first get the count from the state, increment it, and then put it back into the state. And that's all you have to do. Storm will take care of actually checkpointing and saving state for you. So the way automatic checkpointing works um, is it uses the ABS algorithm and the Chandy Lamport algorithm. So what you see is your stateful bolt with the execute method where you deal with incoming tuples and that's when you update your state. Um, then also any stateless bolts in your topology um, are just there, pass through. They do. Um, there's nothing special you have to do with those. But what you actually get under the hood um, is there's a checkpoint spout which will emit checkpoint tuples and will automatically um, take the state from your stateful bolts and push it into a state store. And right now for state stores we support um, an in-memory state which is volatile but it's mainly for um, testing and also Redis at this point. Um, but that's the State API is very, very simple, um, essentially just put and get. Um, so in the future, we're going to be adding a lot more state um, implementations. Um, automatic back pressure is also new. Um, in previous versions of Storm, the only way to throttle the input to your topologies was to enable hacking, um, which is Storm's um, guaranteed delivery mechanism and set topology spout max pending, which essentially throttles um, how many tuples can be in flight at any given time. And a problem with that is if you don't need at least once guarantees for your um, use case, um, it imposes a significant performance penalty. Um, and in earlier versions, that was, I think, up to two times. Um, so if you didn't need at least once processing, if at most was, was good enough for you, um, then you got hit with that performance penalty. In 1.0, that penalty is actually drastically reduced. Um, but now um, you're, you're not you, you can throttle without enabling hacking, so you can get you know, the most performance you, you can possibly get. Um, the way it works is there are high and low watermarks and each one is expressed as a percentage of the buffer size of the incoming and outgoing um, internal messaging queues. And there's a thread that monitors these queues and if the high watermark is reached it will start to throttle the spouts in your topology. And then if the, if the percentage of buffer size goes below the low watermark um, it will stop throttling. Um, this is all handled internally. It, it does not affect the spout API. Um, so all existing spouts um, are supported with back pressure. We also added a resource aware scheduler. Um, Storm supports uh, pluggable schedulers. And what sch schedulers do 
is determine how tasks are distributed among workers in your cluster. Um, by default, the default scheduler will just try to spread tasks out evenly, um, but you, there are multiple um, scheduler implementations. One is a um, isolation scheduler, which allows you to carve up your, your cluster and dedicate certain, certain nodes to specific topologies. Um, what the resource aware scheduler does is allow you to specify the resource requirements in terms of memory and CPU for individual topology components, components being spouts or bolts. Um, it supports, in terms of memory, you can specify both on heap memory and off heap memory um, if you use off heap. Um, not all, actually, not many. Some, um, some users do use off heap. And then for CPU, um, it, because CPU architectures are different, there's no sort of silver bullet to be able to describe um, what, what the CPU capabilities are. So what we do is just use a point system um, based on the number of cores. And it's up to you to, to sort of figure out how you, use, how you assign those points. Um, when you specify resources, you do it on a per component instance. So parallelism matters. So let's say you, you assign X number of cores to a specific bolt instance, and you have parallelism of two, then it's going to request twice as much uh, CPU based on that. Um, CPU and memory availability are described in the storm YAML configuration um, on each supervisor node. Um, so in this case, we're saying um, this supervisor has three gigs of memory, and we've, based on the, the number of cores and CPUs on that node, we've assigned a value of 400. The convention for CPU capacity is to use about 100 for each CPU core. Um, but again, it's up to you how you want to use that point system. So this is what it looks like to um, actually specify resource requirements. Um, this is doing it in, by hard coding it within the topology, something I, I don't really recommend. Um, it's better, you're much better off externalizing that into a configuration file. Um, but for illustration purposes, here we're saying the spout, we want, we want to use up 20 points of the CPU capacity of the cluster. Um, and we're setting some on-heap memory requirements and off-heap memory requirements. And there, it's not required to set um, either or. So in this case, we're just saying uh, for this, for bolt one, set the CPU uh, requirements to 15. And down here, we're setting another memory. Yes? And the CPU load is just for the supervisor or for the whole it's not for the supervisor, it's for the individual component. So okay. we have a bolt here and we're saying, um, so in this case it's memory, we're saying uh, make sure that this bolt lands on a machine that has this amount of memory available left. Um, storm usability improvements. So. Enhanced debugging and monitoring of topology. So that's one of the hard things in um, streaming use cases. So no matter how expressive your, your DSL or your language for defining your streaming computation is, um, a lot of times you really need to have an understanding of the internals of the streaming platform. Um, and in the past with Storm, that's been pretty hard. So we've, we've worked really hard to improve that. Um, one of those is dynamic log level settings. So what this does is either via the Storm UI or the command line interface, you can change the, the log4j log settings um, for a running topology without having to, to start or stop or edit um, log file or log file configurations. It also allows you to um, set an optional timeout um, and once you hit that timeout, all changes will be reverted and you'll go back to the original settings. Um, and all logs, um, I'll get into this later, but all logs are searchable from the Storm UI and Log Viewer. 
So that's what it looks like in the Storm UI to change log file settings. So in this case, com.myapp, select a level, how long you want that change to take place. It'll show you when it's going to expire. Um, and then you can um, essentially, any, any class file that's in your topology, you can um, change the logging levels for it dynamically. And then that's what it looks like um, to change log levels via the, the command line. So in this case, I'm saying logger name, and this is where com.myapp would go, uh, and then assign a timeout. Um, how many people who've used Storm have, had, have put debug bolts or debug trident functions in their topology to, to figure out what's going on? Um, so what tuple sampling does is eliminate that requirement. So in Storm UI, all you have to do is select a topology, uh, topology itself or an individual component like a spatter bolt and click debug. And what that will do, you'll get a prompt that says, you know, how much a percentage of the, the stream of tuples do you want to sample? Um, you could say 1 to 100%. Um, and once that's enabled, you click on the events link in Storm UI and you get a sample of all the tuples that, that flow through. Distributed log search. What this does is, um, in the past, searching through logs was a pain because your logs were all over the cluster. Um, so a lot of times you'd have, I'd have eight terminal windows open and I'd be searching through different log files and trying to make sense of what was going on when it's across multiple log files. Now we have a distributed search that allows you to search all log files across the cluster and then have those results in the Storm UI itself. It also supports um, any archived logs. So if your logs roll over, you can also search through those archived logs. And then the results you get back will include uh, matches from all the supervisor nodes in the cluster. Uh, another new feature added to Storm UI is dynamic worker profiling. And what this does is allows you from Storm UI um, to request various uh, profile information like heap dumps, JSTAC profile recordings, um, and JProfile information. And once you, once you click the button, um, it will create the files, and then in Storm UI, you can download those and um, open them in whatever your, your profiling tool of choice is. Um, you can also restart workers from the UI now as well. Um, another thing we've added is supervisor health checks. Um, so what this does is allow you to, to identify supervisor nodes that are not healthy. And if, the, if Storm determines that a supervisor node is not healthy, it will decommission that node. And when that happens, um, Nimbus will reassign the work from that node to other nodes um, in your cluster. Um, and the way you implement it is really simple. There's a directory, um, a configurable directory in your supervisor nodes where you just put in a, a shell script. And that shell script, if it returns um, a string that starts with error, that indicates that um, the node is no longer healthy and Storm will shut it down. Um, so that allows you to define for yourself what exactly unhealthy is. Um, a good example is, let's say, um, disk usage. You know, the, the disk fills up and you want to decommission that node. All you would have to do is write a shell script that does something like look at DF, figure out that we're getting your 90% full, so let's decommission that node um, and take it offline. Um, and because it's shell scripts, you can use whatever language you, you want supported on the, uh, the OS. Um, in 1.0, we have a number of new integrations, um, including Cassandra support, Solar support, um, Elasticsearch, um, and MQTT. We're starting to see a big up uptick in MQTT um, integration, um, largely driven by um, 
constrained devices and IoT use cases. Integration improvements um, for Kafka. Uh, we've improved a number of things with the existing Kafka spout, and we've developed an alternative Kafka spout that uses the new um, consumer APIs and the, the newer versions of Kafka. Um, we now have an HDFS spout, um, and with, with HDFS, we're starting to see um, with Storm a little blurring of the lines between batch and real time. What the HDFS spout does is um, it's, it's very configurable, but the simplest use case is you point it to a directory and it will watch that directory for files. When a file lands, it will start streaming the data in the file. When it's finished with that file, it will move the file out of the way um, and start looking for the next one. Um, and it allows also allows you to partition that data. Um, for example, in the HDFS bolt, um, you can now partition data um, based on the content of tuples. So you may want some data, depending on the content of the data, you may want it to go into one file or another file. Um, we're supporting that now. Um, we also support Avro integration for HDFS. Um, and we've improved the HBase and Hive uh, integration considerably in terms of um, performance and reliability. Do you have numbers? Do I have numbers? Not offhand. Um, so before I forget, I mentioned this earlier, um, performance. So in 1.0, we're now um, up to 16 times faster in terms of throughput. Um, and I always warn people about performance in streaming situations is it's, it's really highly dependent on your use case. So realistically, you can probably expect um, about three times the uh, throughput, depending on your use case. Um, an example is if, you're, if one of your streaming components is um, writing to a really slow database, that's going to slow everything down. If you're, one of your components is calling out to a REST service that's slow. Same thing. Um, so it's ultimately dependent on your use case. Um, also, latency is now reduced. We're down um, about 60% latency reduction. Again, same caveat in terms of performance. Um, I already mentioned this. Performance varies on your use case. And the most important benchmarks are the ones that you do, not the ones that you see on, in marketing presentations. So Storm 2.0 is already underway at Apache. Um, and the big piece here is we're moving from Clojure to Java. Um, how many people in the audience consider themselves proficient in Java? How many in Clojure? None. OK. That's one of the main reasons. Um, we're broadening the contributor base, and already for the 2.0 um, release, we're seeing a huge uptick um, in the number of um, contributors. Um, another piece there is with Clojure. When we were doing a lot of the, the performance improvements in 1.0, we started to see some, some hot spots in Clojure code where uh, reflection was being used. Um, there are some lookups, some map lookups that did some weird things. Um, whereas if, if we go back to Java, we have a lot, a lot more closer control um, over what's happening within the JVM. Um, another big impetus behind this was um, Alibaba in the past. Um, for the exact same reasons, Forked Storm and uh, re-implemented all the Clojure code in um, Java. So they donated that code to Apache, and we're in the process of um, bringing that in. They didn't have security, so by joining the communities, um, we'll get the benefit of their work on the Java conversion, and they'll get all the security stuff that, that Storm uh, provides. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for the, for the great 
But anyway, so uh, what, how, would this, uh, how can you explain the performance gain? Yes? Um, it's difficult. <laughs> it's, there are lots and lots of tiny improvements. Um, we did some stuff with batching and disruptor queues. Um, we already we migrated a few things um, in terms of closure to Java. Um, so it's, it's a lot of incremental improvements that together um, really increase performance. Any other? Yes. Um, Storm actually does do exactly once if you use the, the Trident API. Um, how can you get exactly once? Um, that's up to you. Um, and if you if you require exactly once, that's probably a problem. Um, you should avoid requiring that if you can, and remove the move those use cases around so you, uh, so you have item potency. Because in reality, exactly once doesn't really exist. So that means uh, the state could be not that accurate, right? Because one couple could be uh, one. Uh, one type of right? Well, if it, um, if your state, what what exact scenario are you talking about in terms of? Because uh, it's not guaranteed exactly once, so one type can be sent twice. Right. In that in that case, if you're if you're doing if you're doing counting, your your counts could be off. I mean, when the state persistent, right? the state. Yeah, it can, you can dedupe in that case. So that's the application response rate. Really. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any chance to see uh, Storm, Storm on your own production ready? Um, we, we are looking at that. That's, that's in the pipeline. Yeah, when it comes to uh, windowing, besides uh, time and besides uh, record based uh, windows, Mm -hmm. you support the session windows or any customer type of uh, window? Yes. That's coming up. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, I couldn't. So the the question is what do, what are the um, a lot of it well one storm has been around a lot longer um, Flink's still relatively young um, another selling point is um, the security story and also depending on your use case being able to balance um, throughput and low latency and integration with external uh, services as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I have a comment. I think in Flink, this is the kind of uh, configure, right? Mm -hmm. The balance between them. So that's kind of, uh, I, I did not, I'm not sure I got what, uh, what you said about uh, balancing throughput versus uh, latency. Yes, please. And I'm, I'm not completely. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I understand what you said when you mentioned the throughput versus latency. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. So, I'm not sure what's I understand your question. So um, the question was the selling proposition. Uh, what's the selling proposition of Storm, right? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that uh, somehow uh, that balance between throughput and latency. Mm -hmm. My understanding, if I'm getting it right, I'm not. Uh, I won't say I'm, I'm an expert. That in Flink uh, you you have uh, this is configurable basically. So you can uh, you, you can have that balance. So what's speci specific about Storm? Um, then in that that case. I don't. I don't know exactly. I'm not that familiar with the um, with the configuration of Apache Flink. Um, but from from what I feedback I've gotten from customers has been that it's it's easier to balance in Storm than it is in Flink.
Yes. So this storm 1.0, when it will be supported in certain work stack? 1.0? Yeah. Um, that's going to be probably, is that 2.4? 2.5. Any other questions? Yes. When 2.0? 2.5. So storm 1.0. Oh yes. When is when is 1.0 going to be available in the HTTP in HTTP 2.5? Um, that's like the June-ish time frame, I believe. And what's the timeline for 2.0? Um, 2.0, we're not setting a timeline. So one of the things, so um, right now, they're, we're hitting regressions as we're, we're converting to Java. Um, so we don't, we don't really set timelines. Um, uh, the community generally releases um, when we feel everything is stable. Although with 1.0, um, our, our release cycle is going to be a lot tighter because we're going to do a lot of point releases when um, any bug fixes are identified. So the, the state management, right, the key value of state, uh, mm -hmm. so is that for like aggregations and when you want to store, well, let's say, for 30 seconds and, and then output commit that to a... To a you know, some, uh, what, what is the purpose of the state management? State management. So, uh, so, so it's persistent. Um, so, let's say you have, um, you're like in a word count situation. <coughs> you're you're counting words and storing that state um, in. You know, the, the API looks like a hash map. Um, and let's say one of the workers goes down. Um, and that work gets reassigned. When that bolt comes back up, it will reinitialize the state based on what's in the state store. So you'll pick up exactly where you left off. Mm -hmm. Yes? Does it also work if you take down the entire topology and update the new code? Uh, yes, it can. Yeah. So the state persists. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you mentioned it's extendable. You're thinking of each base as a? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we'll we'll definitely be adding one for H base. Um, and like I said, it's a, a pretty dead simple API. Um, so like almost all the the data store integration components will likely um, be updated to support state checkpointing. So does it kind of alleviate the need for tip doubling or? It in certain use cases it does. So yeah, you could use um, the state implementation instead of you know flushing things with tick pebbles. Right, that sort of thing. I have always had issues of hacking after a certain amount of time, right? So mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. So the question was, will the, the new Kafka consumer spout be um, compatible with um, secure Kafka? And the answer is yes. OK. Thank you, Thank you guys.